Okay, I'm just going to spend five minutes just briefly saying what happened to Max. Um, so, uh, so Max is 15. Um, th this is Max here with his two sisters and his mum. This is my family. This is Max's 15th birthday. It was his last birthday. He was, Max, he's fit and well, 15-year-old, uh, he had lifelong asthma, uh, no ICU admissions, he was perfectly well that day, uh, he known lifelong allergies to tree nuts and carried his EpiPen everywhere. Uh, he was staying with his grandma as he did once a week for many years. Um, he, uh, he ate a dish accidentally that contained ground walnuts. So it was a big dose uh, in some apple crumble. Uh, his mum was around the corner about to pick him up uh, and he was 10 minutes drive from the nearest hospital with an ECMO service. He experienced itch, one vomit and developed wheeze. Um, he used his EpiPen himself, he started using his Ventolin, triple zero was called at the same time uh, and it was 13.50 on a Friday. There was no healthcare system stress that day. Um, so this is what happened to Max. Uh, and he's in the care of paramedics for 28 minutes before he arrested. When they arrived, his sats were 100%. He was tachypneic. He could speak in sentences. He could tell them uh, that he had anaphylaxis. They said, oh, he looks like he, you've got asthma, Max. And he said, no, no, this is anaphylaxis. It's come on too quickly. Uh, he gets some um, uh, intramuscular adrenaline. They call for some backup. Uh, they give him a second dose of IM adrenaline. Um, but then, due to a set of circumstances and some uh, sort of staff, uh, um, there, there was some junior staff involved and some equipment failure. Uh, he ended up getting into the ambulance uh, and he um, effectively arrested just as he was getting his third dose of IM adrenaline and then he got an IV dose. So he really only got two doses of IM adrenaline before he arrested. Um, and his last words were, I'm going to die. Uh, and he said that in a very clear voice. He, his mum was in the front of the ambulance. There was no altered voice, no airway symptoms. This is what happened when he arrived in the ED. So his GCS was three. Uh, these were the OBS, normal blood pressure. Uh, SATs were 43% and there was apparent seizure activity. He had IV access in situ. Um, FASM 1 is the team leader. FASM 2 takes the airway. Face them 2 stated that they can ventilate easy, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, unlikely, um, with bag valve mask. And face them 1 says, are you sure? Face them 2 says, yes. And they give midazolam for the hypoxic seizure. So uh, at the same time, I'm leaving my work in, in uniform. Um, and I ring uh, uh, another face them and they said don't don't worry there'll, there'll be anaesthetists there but really what i wanted them to say is don't worry there's a there's a good crew of emergency physicians there um this is max's hard deck which was on arrival uh he got a milligram uh, sorry a half a milligram of uh, i am adrenaline and that'll take five minutes for maximum effect and then he gets a very low dose of adrenaline infusions nine minutes after he arrives they call a code blue, they don't try to intubate. He, uh, he, the, the anaesthetist comes and uh, decides it's a, uh, that the airway might be difficult, so he doesn't have an attempt at intubating. And it wasn't until the intensivist comes along that the first attempt happens 16 minutes after he arrives. Then that was difficult, a dose of rocuronium, and then another episode, uh, another attempt. And in between, as the rocuronium, or well just before the rocuronium's given, I arrive, um, it's a chaotic resuscitation room. It's cl clear to me that Max is uh, unintubated and, um, and that's the problem. And it, it effectively, he was asystolic with a couple of agonal beats. Um, I, I became the de facto team leader. Uh, I directed the surgical airway. Uh, the intensive care consultant uh, cut Max's neck, but was on the wrong side and uh, was on the head side, and nobody on the on the on the feet side to help. So I had to go around and put my finger in Max's neck to um, to, to put the bougie in, um, and uh, and then I took over ventilation from the anaesthetist. And within two minutes, Max's heartbeat came back, as you would expect from an hypoxic arrest and then um, 
and then his oxygen saturations come up slowly, um, but he's being plumbed for ECMO at this point. Um, and he goes on to ECMO and, and we sort of relax the, the medical treatment. Um, this is Max uh, and his surgical airway. Um, it's, he's a much better looking boy than that. Yeah, this is what you look like when yeah, you've um, just been resuscitated. Um, now, the reason I'm showing you this picture is because I want you to appreciate that there's no blood, there's no depressed skull fracture. Um, Max's arm is not hanging off, that there's no trauma, there's nothing to, to say um, that, that you know, all of the things that cause people to panic in emergency, none of those things are present. Max just silently died, for, well, you know, his, his brain was irreversibly damaged just silently while, while people tried to do things around him rather than what actually mattered. So um, I just want you to take home that picture that hypoxic brain injury is silent and there's no cue. You, 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 you need to be looking for the cues. The, the, there's no, it's not, not dramatic appearing, but at this point Max's brain is irrecoverably damaged. I, I'm not going to go through these slides. I'll, I'll put them up as part of the presentation, uh, looking at it. Max's airway management. I was the sixth person to manage Max's airway. Um, but there was a laryngoscope and, uh, a, and an intubating capable person for the entire duration of Max's arrest, including beforehand. And breathing, uh, you know, was a linear deterioration until he decompensated. Um, it was, you know, he became in, uh, incontinent and, uh, and asked for help and was predictably deteriorating um, until he decompensated and, and became uncom uh, unconscious. And in terms of circulation, it was never a problem. Uh, so um, I'd just like to share with you what, with what happened to Max. Um, three hours later, he had a bronchoscopy which showed significant laryngeal edema. So um, while he had no airway symptoms when he stopped breathing and became unconscious, uh, the delay in time to intubation um, meant that laryngeal edema occurred and presumably that was what was making the airway difficult. Um, it, his arrest, I want to be clear though, was purely from bronchospasm and the asthma component. He was on ECMO for four days, mainly because of aspiration in his, in his right upper lobe. Um, he had a devastating hypoxic brain injury with an autopsy and MRI report that shows uh, d d those findings that I described earlier in the earlier uh, section. He uh, got transferred to the Children's Hospital. He was off all support on day seven. He just had his trachea in, um, but he could only poke out his tongue to command. Um, he could move his limbs, but not purposefully. Uh, um, and uh, on day 13, uh, uh, the, uh, I could actually go outside with Max and uh, uh, the, the day before he died with one of the ICU nurses. Um, but then at seven o'clock, oh, we got a phone call in the morning and he just suddenly and totally unexpectedly died. We we're actually filling out the disability paperwork for him. Um, and that was uh, because of his brain injury that that happened. We like to think that that was Max's choice. This was the rainbow over Melbourne when we opened our curtains the next day on our first day without Max. Um, it was taken from a different place by a friend. And this is a much better picture of Max. This is uh, so how I want you to remember him. He's a, uh, a happy boy. He's just been de to the Kit Kat factory in Sydney, and he's got his uh, he's got his Kit Kats with his he, he went with his sisters. Thanks very much, everyone.